study that involved engaging Ugandans in the different regions, seeking their views on what kind of country they would love to live, be, to live in beyond the Golden Jubilee milestone. This study is part of the key activities undertaken as the country prepares to celebrate 50 years of independence and serves to help the population reflect on its troublesome history that still haunts many families today. Like previously emphasized on Spectrum, the Golden Jubilee is a milestone which comes with a critical responsibility of shaping a better destiny for Uganda, politically, economically and socially. In order to shape a bright future, it is incumbent upon all citizens to engage in dialogue. But it is also critical that the powers that be, especially the political actors, take a keen interest in these views and include them in the national agenda. The study by the Center for Basic Research culminates into national dialogue, focusing on the key findings and a way forward. So on Spectrum tonight, we examine the issues raised by Uganda through this study and try to identify the gaps that need to be filled to address some of the challenges they noted as we seek to build a united and prosperous country. Our guests tonight, Associate Professor Josephine Ahikere, Executive Director of the Center for Basic Research. You're most welcome, Professor Ahikere. Thank you very much. Well, Good evening, listeners. You're also joined by Mr. Nicholas Opio, legal consultant at Akijil, also social and political commentator. You're most welcome, Mr. Nicholas Opio. Thank you very much. Good evening to my fellow panelists and good evening to all the listeners. We're also joined by Dr. Mwambusi Ndevesa, Senior Lecturer of History at Macquarie University. You're most welcome, Dr. Ndevesa. Good evening, uh, listeners. Professor Aikere, what was the purpose of your study? Thank you. Uh, maybe to start with, I had Center for Basic Research, uh, a research organization that has been around for about 25 years. And our purpose is really to create knowledge that is uh, relevant for the Ugandan society by Ugandans. Because at the time that CBR was uh, established, we recognized that most of us were just research assistants of people for questions that have been designed elsewhere outside of Uganda. And so CBR stands for that locally relevant knowledge. Through this study on amplifying citizens' voices, we are really focused on bringing the citizen to the table of creating the narrative on Uganda as a nation. We realize that most of the time we concentrate on leaders, what we call the supply side of politics, and we deny ourselves the chance to actually look at the demand side what the citizens are saying and so in this case we've been largely uh, dealing with a largely passive citizenry people just consume what the politicians have produced for them rather than also them actively participating in shaping governance in this country. You want the citizens to participate actively? Yes. You're not satisfied with walk to work and walk to freedom? You want something stronger? <laughs> <laughs> want something stronger, something embedded and something more enduring. Not with not, bare hands, not, not working with, with bare hands. Not with bare hands, not brutal, but something constructive and not not events, but something that becomes part of our democratic processes. Process. Yes. What did you find in your study? Uh, we what did the out, people tell you? Yes, the people said a lot, and uh, it's not possible to summarize in this hour. But the main points that um, my colleague Mwambuti and I will present relates to people reflecting on Uganda as a nation. Where are we? How did we get there? What Uganda do we want to see? And in general terms, I could say that there is some sense of optimism in terms of relative freedom of speech, easy communication, transport, increase of access to education, although it has a question mark in terms of quality, but there were deep frustrations. Deep frustrations. Yes. What do the people want? Change. People want change in the way the governance uh, direction is facing. They want a rerouting 
like if the train is facing ginger, they want it to reroute because we don't seem to be facing the right direction, by and large. Strong political statements coming from a lady researcher. Let's hear from Dr. Ndevesa. What's your view of these uh, submissions? Uh, in broad terms is that uh, the research for this study which captured narratives of the citizens uh, in the different categories of citizens we are talking about the elites but also the grassroots people the youth the elderly was aimed at capturing as my colleague talked uh, demand side of democracy and to gauge whether citizens were civically competent to put it even differently whether they were actually citizens because a citizen is not somebody who has got certain rights of uh, belonging to a territory or country but also somebody who participates in public affairs and that was that that's what it was aimed at and you find that we had uh, some uh, narratives from kampara kabare guru uh, Hoima, Busia, Ruero, and this was generally representative of the country. And uh, in certain respects, you find some commonality of issues. Like, say, everybody was worried about corruption and corruption levels in this country. Uh, people were also about governance, they were talking about term limits. Oh. Everybody was, uh, most of these people raised the issue of term limits. Uh, police brutality uh, almost in all of them but others were concerned about their mundane issues like employment or lack of an uh, lack of employment uh, and the corruption commercialization of, of votes and things like that uh, that is what we captured but let me tell you mr moderator about uh, one thing also that was common in most of these areas where we went is that hardly do people have a clear way forward it seems the way forward is not clear uh, we are still uh, groping in some kind of a fog as the way forward whereas people were very quick uh, to point out what is negative what is positive maybe today but uh, on the question of what do you want in the next 50 years, it was not so easy. Another common thing was about identification with this independence. Uh, most people did not easily give out the meaning of this independence. They don't see a connection, a connection, a, reson a resonance with uh, this independence, its meaning. And on the question of like nationalism, uh, many respondents did not feel that there was nationalism or a soul of the nation in this country. And it is still something that people uh, are lacking. And almost all of them were talking about that one, that they, there is no meaning, there is no attachment to this nation. Uh, actually, it is just a country. And actually, some few people could point out that Uganda is not a viable project. Some few people could point out that one boldly that they don't see Uganda as a viable project. So we, we, we need to work on this issue of nationalism in the next 50 years. Any viable project? Prefer to live in a wider country or what? A smaller, balkanized <laughs> <laughs> No, but that is African community or Uganda and so on. Small states. I mean, those are the sentiments that uh, you find many people actually in this country, and even those ones, we, some of the people we captured the, their views, they were saying that uh, I am so and so in, in terms of ethnic identity first, and then Uganda country. next. Very few people could say I am a Ugandan first and and they, and they think such and such second. Right. You can see so the challenge we have. Tribe is number one. Identity, those uh, primordial tribal whatever identities are still strong, but nobody, of course, would say that he would want to discard the the Ugandanness, the eth ethnic identities, but again we find that those ethnic identities are still stronger and weak as identifying with 
the country. In other words, the question of nationalism is still lingering and it has to be addressed. So we need to be taught patriotism. Well, uh, uh, teaching is not the question. Of you are not going to teach how to love your country. No, you see, people are pointing out issues that touch their lives and they could easily connect with the nation and with this independence if it addressed, if it can't be meaningful unless it addresses their livelihoods. So they don't easily connect the independence and their livelihood. And so mundane things like uh, employment, food security, uh, job availability, and things like that are uh, the ones which would be meaningful to the people now. You can continue talking, talking, teaching, sensitizing until you get tired. People will not easily connect with the nation if you are denied, for example, opportunities of participating in decision making in the country. People will not easily connect. That's why even our, poli our, our national symbols do not have much meaning to the people because they can only have meaning if they translate into their day-to-day -day lives. Bread and uh, butter, like they say. Nicholas, do such studies like these have any value that they add? What kind of value do they add to society? <laughs> they do definitely add a lot of value, in, you know, in terms of, in ter in terms of you know, engaging the people and, 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 and allowing discussions on some of the key and important issues in, in our country, but also to feel the pulse though, of, of, of the people who ordinarily the media perhaps who didn't give a chance to speak. So I think reports like this is important, processes like this is important. And, and just to give you a bit of context, as part of my Jubilee celebrations, I've, I've taken time... Your yeah, personal Jubilee celebrations? Yes, yes. <laughs> you have a to read, flag somewhere? Just, just to read the history of our country, and, right. I, and I've taken to reading four reports. The first report is the report on violations of human rights in Uganda from 1962 to 1986. Uh, you know, the, human the commission rights. set up by, 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 by His Excellency the President, headed by Justice Odao. Just Arthur Odao? Yes. The, 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 the second report that I'm, I'm reading, which I'm about to finish, is, is, is the constitutional making process, the Justice Odao report. You know, these are very huge reports. But I also read the Citizen Manifesto and the Youth Manifesto and the Women Manifesto that were developed prior to the last election uh, by a group of, uh, you know, CSOs in this town. And Civil I can society organization. Uh, yes, I can tell you that there's a lot of similarities in all of the issues that are being mentioned in this report. In all of those reports? Yes. Stretching across different time time, yes. time, time, yes. time gaps. You have the question of, you know, peaceful transfer of power, gross violations of human rights, issues of economic injustice, issues of equality and equity in our country. These are common trends. These are common issues in our country. And they have been here with us. Reports have been written. Things have been done. And I think that it's time for us to begin to discuss concretely moving forward, the way forward from these reports. Because discussing them will go around the same issues. Uh, so I think that the most important thing is to go forward. And, and, and if that's agreed, my suggestions would be a couple of issues. Because what you see happening in our country is that we haven't conquered the basics in life. Okay? A man who is poor, hungry, unemployed, unhealthy, has bad schools, bad roads, will never think about innovation, will never think about research. These researchers, are, you can see, they are very healthy looking, you know, they have conquered the they basics. Have conquered the <laughs> 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 they have conquered the basics. They don't worry about food. They have a doctor today. <laughs> <laughs> they don't worry about food. They don't worry about food, about schools and things like that. So we've got to begin to go to a country where, a country in which people have conquered the basics and that our worry is not food that our worry is not schools right. but rather scientific <coughs> innovations research takes this country forward right. the second issue that I think is critical that we must address is, is the overall question of governance there is this whole mystery and I think in my view lie about the fact that power belongs to the people the truth is it does not I think it is time for us to begin to unmask that lie that is perpetuated by, I think, Article Two. Of, I mean, Article One of the Constitution, because the very same Constitution, like it has done in the past, gives the, those broad powers but takes them away. Even in instances where the powers are supposed to be with the people, the exercise of all those powers are severely limited by by an overly powerful uh, executive, 
by a weak in a weak legislature, by an extremely over domineering uh, army in the history of our country. So I think that we've got to begin to empower people. To, to take part in their governance. And these processes are good, and I think that it has to be encouraged. Because if you don't do that, you're still going to go on the same issues because governance is, is, is the pivot, is, 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 is the pivot upon which all of these things rotate. And we must address those issues. If you don't address them, we are bound to go about you know the same issues for the next fifty years like we've done. Those are interesting reports you've read. I've read only three of them. I think I've not I've not read the document the Odell report. I've not read the women's manifest. So would you want to come out with the document spelling out the threads that you pick, the parallels that cross you know, because they come from different timelines. Uh, is that, that something you would consider? Well, it's something I would I would want to do if, 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 if it is going to be useful because there's no point in doing something in vain. I think that if if if, if there's there's an opportunity for doing a thing like that, it is important we can do it. Because these things are here. And I, I don't think many Ugandans know about these reports. You know, I was listening into a debate yesterday on radio and, and, and you know I had people like Paul Lit Young speaking, people like John Naganda. John Naganda actually sat on, he was on, on the Odell Committee on the Odell report as a farmer. I don't know what he was farming though. But he was on that commission. He was good. So, so some of these things are things that have been discussed before. I think it is time to put them into action, and this has to be done and done quickly if Uganda is supposed to, I mean, to 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 be a viable project 50 years going forward. I can tell you, just to give you an analogy, I think that Uganda, if if it was a person, it's been a person with a septic wound. This wound has been treated by many doctors. It doesn't feel. Others are witch doctors. Others are real doctors. Others are quack doctors. This one appears to be the problem. It is not a matter of, I just wanted to comment on one of the issues you pointed out. It's not a matter of also a question of uh, bread and butter that will build a nation. Tanzania is one of the nations uh, that uh, has succeeded to create a sense of nationhood. And yet they are not so rich. But I think there was something that created the nationhood in Tanzania. There could be many factors, but one of them is justice. You must exercise justice. I'm not talking about the legal justice. I'm near a lawyer here. Social justice. I'm talking about social justice and economic justice, which actually Nyerere pursued. Nyerere pursued the question of justice and the greater happiness for the greater majority. I think he was grounding it in a certain philosophy. And that one actually assisted uh, national integration in Tanzania. And that's why, by the way, today Tanzania is one of those countries that is uh, dragging behind on issues of East African integration. Yes. It's because they are nationalists. They have some sovereign nationalism to hang on, which they don't want to leave to, to give out easily. But these others who are not nationalists, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when you say we go East Africa, we go, we go, we go, we go, like the other people in the Nambori Stadium, you know. That's what the reason. So the, it, it is not just about um, justice, I think there is a sense in which a nation is not built by accident. And even if uh, you have uh, maybe um, economic um, uh, inequalities, there is a sense, uh, I wouldn't say that in Tanzania there is equity, uh, equity economic no. equity. But they were, there was a, a sense in which the leadership took particular steps to build a nation. It is not built by accident. And that's why when we tried to, to tell people that, okay, um, you can uh, participate in this and, and involve yourselves in making Uganda a better place, they said, no, don't mislead us. Leadership is the key. Leadership has to be purposeful. Leadership has to be interested in the nation. There was a sense in which they said, Uganda seems to belong to nobody. The, the, even the leaders don't seem to love the country. And that was a very strong message to say, we don't have a nation. And one of the things uh, actually under the NGO Forum platform, uh, what is coming out is that there is a process to actually build that kind of, of purposeful uh, nationhood that 
citizens uh, get their responsibility. If, if I may just interject for a minute, yeah, I, I think also the, the truth is the state has to be involved in the lives of the people because I think what is happening is that people don't feel part of the state. Yes. They feel detached. They, they feel, feel that they detached. live in spite not because of the state. Yes. So I think that the activism that you see is a result of a, a, negligent, a negligent state, a disconnected state. In fact, people who work for the state have constantly told people, don't worry about oil, care about your own farming. Don't worry about governance, care about farming. You, you, you go and dig your gardens. I think we must begin to have a connection between the ordinary people and the functions of the state. On that one, I want to give an example that is happening now. You can imagine the whole independence celebrations on the 9th of October yes. has been made a state project. Actually, to participate as citizens, independent or autonomously, has been made illegal. I think that <laughs> the police has said, not only the police has said, yeah, they should have this, this conditions <laughs> beyond the fact that this coming along the streets from Cape Gumas so On the 9th of October, on the 7th. any celebration beyond the state structures <laughs> has been prescribed. We are going to break this inspector on radio and we'll be back to the station. One, two, three, come on, Jack. We go. MTN, everywhere you go. To celebrate 50 years of Uganda's independence, ShopRite is offering you amazingly low prices on a wide range of proudly Ugandan products like a 1.5 liter bottle of Coke, Coke Zero, Sprite or Fanta at 2,800 shillings only. A 330 ml bottle of Now Gold at 1,850 shillings only. Whole chicken per kilogram at 11,500 shillings only. You also stand a chance to win one of 50 proudly Ugandan and hampers worth a hundred thousand Uganda shillings each. See in store for details. Prices valid until the 14th of October 2012. ShopRite. Lower prices you can trust always. As we celebrate 50 special years, Nile Special invites you to toast to our great land. Nile Special, the rich, rewarding taste from the source. You've earned it. When I sip from the Nile. Not for sale to persons under 18. The Woolworths Quality Sale is now on. Get up to 40% of selected fashion clothing at Woolworths Metroplex Mall, Northern Bypass, Nalia, and Garden City Shopping Centre, Lower Kololo. But hurry, or you'll miss out. Woolworths, the difference. Spectrum on Radio 1 FM 90. Welcome back on Spectrum tonight. What kind of Uganda are citizens yearning for beyond the Golden Jubilee? Uganda marks 50 years this year from in of independence uh, since that it was granted by the British colonists in 1960. To our guests to discuss this this, uh, this topic, Associate Professor Josephine Ahikira, Executive Director of the Center for Basic Research, Mr. Nicholas Opio, legal consultant at Akiju. The only land professor on the show. <laughs> yes, uh, social and political commentator, and Dr. Mwambu Siandemis, a senior lecturer of history at Makere University. You will be what call it and contribute to this discussion. Professor Hikire, you spoke about rerouting this country. That's a big word. What do you mean by rerouting this country? Uh, according to the voices that um, are coming out, they seem to suggest that we need to restructure the way the governance of this country uh, is going. 
For example, the strong statement that Uganda is not a viable project is about the fact that we are not a nation. How do you create a nation? That's something we need to ask ourselves. The, the voices seem to say the rampant corruption right from the top to the lowest level is... What do you mean top? The, the permanent secretaries? <laughs> ministers, we've seen ministers uh, carrying away state... Uh, uh, Masks. Masks. <laughs> so it is not about um, permanent secretaries it's and it's bureaucrats. It's almost... All, you know, right from uh, from the top. A permanent secretary is gone. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, madam. Yes. Um, the issue about um, the perpetuation of uh, people in leadership, the fact that people uh, occupy positions in perpetuity is seen as a problem because then citizens are saying that breeds unaccountable leadership and that needs to be addressed. And part of the governance issue, um, moderator, is that people are also saying that the lack of social cohesion is part and parcel of the governance. What do you mean social cohesion? People sit in one day in pubs and they socialize regardless of tribe. What's wrong? What do you mean social lack social of social cohesion? <laughs> Okay, men socialize in bars, but where do other people socialize? Where, where is the nation, where is the project being created? Uh, there is a lot of violence on the street, in the families, and that impacts on our cohesion. There is a lot of uh, lack of um, accountability, and people feel, for instance, Education services, health services are part of the governance question. They are not just social services. It is about the way the whole governance issue is organized. Nicholas, what can trigger nationalism anywhere? Uh, well, see, the point is nationalism is not something you teach to people. It occurs because of the connection between the state What and do you mean? What about desk in status to teach just that? What do you mean? Well, that's, why, that's, why that's, why that's, that's the waste of, well, yes, the waste of public resources. You don't have to teach Ugandans to love their country if the country Uganda is relevant to their people. The problem is that the country has not been relevant to a common man. Explain that. A person who does not have food in his house, a person who has no drugs in the hospital, a person who has no hope in life, he wakes up in the morning to go and fend for a living and he sees no hope. The state has lost meaning to its citizens. We've got to get the state to begin to provide the basic social public good that we need for a country. Then the people begin to feel a part of that country. The only time I feel I love my country is when I go abroad, it's when I fly the flag. Because I see other people loving their country, and a sense of identity it ca you is, is, is then ignited in me. Then I say, I'm also Ugandan, you know, then I fly and I my love car. Your country. <laughs> because when I'm here, I drive the car, my car on this road, it's breaking down every day. And yet you have a state that collects money from us every, every day. That, I think, is the problem. We've got to have a relevant state to the people of this country. But, but the second is another uh, Let's hear from Nicholas, then we'll come to you, Doctor. No. I would like you to mm. respond. But, but I was responding. No, it's okay. You can okay, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on Doctor. Uh, I was saying it's not only just a, a question of uh, having something to to feed on or to, to, to own in, in the sense of material ownership. I, I think it is uh, sometimes much more than material ownership. That's true. Mm. Uh, we need some of those intangibles. True. Uh, also, a feeling that you are owning this country because there is, I mean, these people who are demonstrating are not uh, the them, poorest yeah. <laughs> of the poor. Uh, but they feel they are marginalized, they feel they are not part of the state and the decision making in this country uh, and uh, they are trying to find space mm. in this whole national project. The national project should be, be for everybody but it should not be for some chosen few. If, if I may just complete my point. Yes. Uh, you see, the, the very first point which you feel relevant is if you truly can determine who leads you. Well, elections every five we years. The elections, like the LC elections ones, themselves, them, elections in and of themselves, are not necessarily a reflection of a true uh, sense of what people want. You know the kind of elections we have. 
people steal elections, people buy votes. People actually think that the only time you connect to somebody is during elections, you get your 5,000 shillings, get your souls, and wait five more years. I think we've got to begin to have credible, free and fair elections that reflect the will of the people. Secondly, I think there has to be a predictable transfer of power. Our constitution bemoans the fact that never in our history have we had a peaceful transfer of power from one person to another. The question of term limits have got to be, to be discussed. Let's see, let me just in simple terms to the common person tell you where no term limit, what it means. Having no term limits is having an obese father who is drinking and having starving children who, if these kids ask for food, he becomes violent. He beats them up on the streets. He locks them up in jail. He passes re repressive laws to curtail dissent. Like the overtwist of the old. <laughs> you remember overtwist? <laughs> so you've got to have a power balance in this home called Uganda where the children, the wife, the relatives and the father have some sort of balance, sort of equilibrium, who feel, they feel part of this family. The problem is, some of us in this country don't feel a part of that family. Professor Akira, talk to us, if you became head of state tomorrow, what kind of national project would you be working on? <laughs> <laughs> Good challenge. First of all, uh, as Okio has said, I would facilitate citizens to be part of the nation. What I'm saying right now is not treason. There was a time when that would <laughs> I would be pulled out, dragged out of this place. Right now it can't happen because it's no longer treason. Talk to us, madam. Yes, uh, and of course that was raised. That is relative freedom of speech and it could be uh, better and could, um, you know, be uh, you know more substantial than, than it is now. But I think what is important really is to make that connection, to ensure that the state is not a, a, a sort of a, 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 a clique, but that the state is an instrument to serve citizens. In fact, um, citizens are saying these leaders should know that they are there because they are supposed to serve us, not to serve themselves. So in other words, I would create a responsive state. How do you wish buttons? Talk People to us about the three buttons you would touch. People-centered. People-centered um, state policies. People-centered state practices. Let's talk about practices. In a week, your first week, what would you do, for instance, to come and you know, three things you would do <laughs> to break the eyes, you know, the medicine? No, I want to get out of this studio very well. <laughs> Give us the reasons of the, the kind of <laughs> presidency you would desire you regard as ideal. <laughs> and maybe leadership is not just about the president. Well, it's going to get more power buttons uh, up there. If we started from the constitution, it would mean, really, as people have yearned, restoration of key milestones for accountable leadership. And restoration of term limits would just be one of the easiest well, but you could restore time limits and then begin to load for 10 years after that load for 10 years <laughs> what well, did you do there's a limit so I would <laughs> after, 10 after 10 years well i could tell you precisely what i would do <laughs> you know, transfer of power Nicholas, i could yeah. tell you precisely what i would do <laughs> talk to us you know, uh, plot one like a solo road <laughs> first and foremost mm -hmm. reform our social service delivery systems health education roads hospitals, schools, all of this have got to be reformed. No, we, 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 no, no I mean, it's so what I would do. <laughs> what I would embark on, you would open. Okay? Yes. Top of my agenda. Second thing, I would clearly, clearly begin to retrace the governance consensus arrived at at the time we made our 1995 constitution and restore that governance agenda. Among others, term limits, uh, a fairly independent, uh, an independent parliament, an independent judiciary, and a completely, completely functional and, 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 and well-resourced oversight systems, IGG, you know, DPP, the police, all of these guys must be well-resourced, well-functioning, and independent of influences of politicians. We we'll do that very clearly, because those are the key things you have got to do. The third thing I would do very clearly, and, and tomorrow if I had the powers, is to have an army that is out of politics and out of police functions.
That is important because the army has had a very big shadow looming over our politics since independence. You've got to define their roles very clearly and put them in the barracks to defend this country from foreign aggression. Dr. Ndeves, sir. Um, <laughs> what would I do? <laughs> there is something that these lawyers can tell you when a president passes some uh, uh, decree kind of, what do yes. you call it, if it's not a decree. Uh, there, there is a legal term they use. Yes, to set in, in place a process for a national conference. Because this is not a one man, one woman project. I would reconstitute the state, the, 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 the society, civil society. You know, in Uganda, I have ever used this word, but I, people will excuse me if I use it again and they, they didn't like it. The, the, our society has been deconstructed. I would reconstruct it. Where is the farmers' uh, movement? You know, farmers, they used to have cooperatives. They now give them districts. <laughs> Where is the labor movement? The labor movement today is not something to talk about. There used to be a vibrant youth movement in the 60s. We don't no longer have a vibrant youth movement. Today. There used to be a vibrant student movement that connected itself to the country. No, so it's a the Nusus and all that. So we would ha I would have to reconstruct Mother's, so that mother's Union. Uh, so that they, they, they reconstructed union is still there. So that they reconstructed society constructs the state. We even used to have a uh, time cancer show. So a national conference the to list. have uh, these narratives from different areas until we have a meta narrative at the at national the level. All right. So that we own the state and we own this country. And once you inspire and create that feeling among the people that the national governance question is nationally owned, then everything else will be added onto it. But right. today, when we are celebrating 50 years and they have said that nobody should organize beyond the state, <laughs> everybody should always uh, be part of the state celebrations, I mean, you are detaching the state and the nation right. from the people, and that is the problem. So that's what I would do to pass that decree that <laughs> and put in place a process and look for funds to immediately start a process of a national conference that is not that a presidential directive yes. that is not going to be state dominated. That's how I reconstruct the nation. We saw doctors mm -hmm. messes in those days. Some kind of yeah. one one oneness. <laughs> they, they are better one of the <laughs> This is from the listeners. This is spectrum already one. You can call in now. Our number zero four one four three four eight one 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 zero three one two two six zero three nine zero zero three one two two six one three nine zero. When you call in, please tell us your name and where you are calling from. Spectrum, hello. Hello. Yes, sir, your name? Good evening. Good evening to you. Thanks for the guest in the studio. And uh, my name is Jimmy. Like you want to know, <laughs> what I have said is what I have always sung for the last 10 years in the life of Radio 1. Spectrum. I thank them. Thank you. Thank you very much. We need Ugandan to think and talk like they have talked. Those peasants who we buy for 5,000 shillings after every five years. Two, Uganda should be told that one day there was a liberator who told them that the problem of Africa is the leaders who are to power. Yes, yes, that. They should be reminded. Sadly and luckily, I wish they were confused. Because every other day, when they need, even you and the moon, I remember you, our days of uh, our magazine. Every day we should remember that we deserve better because we deserve better and not everybody should take the for granted. The ruler is tired. 25 years, 26 years? No, it's enough. Good evening. Spectrum, hello. Hello. Your name, my friend. Mr. Guma, please switch off your radio and talk to us. Okay. Very well, thanks. How are you, Mr. Guma? Good evening, sir. Yeah. I think we should really, really keep away from uh, attacking the person of the president. Um, the issue here at hand, we are trying to talk about uh, the 15 years of uh, our independence. And I don't think it's only 2007. Who has been the leader of this country since the president? 
Hello, we seem to be losing you, Mr. Guma. Oh. You seem to have had a weak network, you can still call back in. Spectrum, yes, your name? My name is Demas Kashaya. Mr. Kashaya, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Edmond, uh, first of all, I want to join the listeners of Radio 1. Of course, uh, we are also celebrating first years listening and contributing uh, on, on air without getting any payment from individuals. Uh, and that one is a sign of patriotism. Now, Sincere speaking, any mature sofa Uganda, if we recall a person who is about 30 years, don't you think that we deserve celebration? You see, if you look at, I have traveled a bit and gone to some, say, uh, some countries like the United States, when it comes to national celebration, the politics become actually history. All people unite. When will Uganda mature, having national issues suppressing individual interests? We are saying, okay, because you see, Uganda is especially in opposition. They are seeing Uganda during the civil society. But we are saying since uh, since 9 October 1962, the, the, the life of better for the colors have passed through, and what we have achieved should be celebrated. So if we are celebrating this, why can't we join this after celebration? Come out and mobilize the colors. If it must be for a prayer to Okay. And 50 years comes only once in any light. Spectrum, hello? Hello? Okay. We, uh, uh, we, we lost that last one. Let's get back to the studio. Madam, I care. Okay. Let, let, let us, yeah, let's, let's keep it there. We deserve to celebrate. I think that is an undeniable fact. Independence is um, important and having been independent for the last 50 years is something to celebrate, no question about it. But I think, Some people think we got independence too early. No, 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 I would, I would not accept that as an African. They say South Africa, we got independence very recently and this is the most no, developed in South Africa. Africa is the they are killing each other. They are killing <laughs> each other, the blacks <laughs> are in shanty towns. Don't look at Johannesburg and the streets and you, you don't Sandton. see Sandton. And Sandton and you don't see what, where the black people are living. You would not want to know. So I, I think that independence on its own is a viable project. However, as Ugandans, we say that we should not stop at celebration. We should critically analyze that independence. How have we deployed it? And do we need to do better in terms of moving ahead? Because we have to be accountable to the next generation. If we destroy the nation now, then history will judge us harshly. So you think poli opposition politicians should be in color law, <laughs> that, uh, whether with, with or without cards? In Ideally, cards. they should be in color law or somewhere else. I think there should not be a monologue of celebration. We should celebrate in any way that we would, you know. For example, I don't think that the whole 31 million people can fit in the ground. So you think After if DC wants to go to Nambole, <laughs> <laughs> you think of this if to Nambole, they should be allowed to go to Nambole to celebrate it, yes. Whatever, you do, if people, people can go to Nashiko. The cooperative union can celebrate its own <laughs> the kind of independence and so on. I think the problem is that we tend to create mono projects and that is exclusive. It then tends to exclude the, the various voices and various identities. Dr. Davis, in my opinion, we sh uh, I don't know which English word to use. I don't think we should celebrate. We should mock. 
the day of independence or mark 50 years of independence rather than using the word celebration and we should take advantage of this turning point in the history of a country to reflect on what went wrong what went right so that we can have a balance sheet and see how to go ahead and how to correct where we went wrong otherwise to just go in a celebratory move mood and celebrate as a state project when you have told when the police has told everybody not celebrate but not celebrate outside the state structures we should ask ourselves why Definitely, even if one doesn't support what the opposition is doing or whatever, we should also ask ourselves why aren't they celebrating so that we address why people are not going to Koro and would want to mark the day separately so that we address it but not dismiss it in a militaristic way. Say, we shall arrest you, we shall jail you, we shall crush you, we shall tear you. I think that's not nation building. We need also to listen to each other so that we bring in all different forces and convince them that actually this is a worthwhile project and that's how we should move. But the moment we use force and militarism to address political questions, then they will continue nagging and nagging as they have done. Obote did it in 66, it didn't work. Amin did it in 71, it did not work. UNLF tried to do it in the 70s, it didn't work. NRM came into power. Yeah, and he came back again. He, he, he came back. Came but back. how long did he last? Actually, he wasn't oh, in the yes. situation. NRM banned political parties, more or less like Obote and Amini did. It has not worked. So, how do we find a way of celebrating and marking in a manner that all are feeling that they are all feel that they are involved? In other words, we need to have compromise, we need to have tolerance, we need to understand that Uganda is not a one-person, one-group project. It but is a collective project. What do you do with people who want to sabotage the revolution? You to crush them. <laughs> who wants to sabotage the revolution? The revolution? What do you do with them? Doctor revolution Harris. indeed. I don't know about the revolution, but <laughs> you know, there are those people who might be opposed to what is going on, revolution or no revolution. And uh, I am not saying that the state should not stand its ground, but at the same time, it should find mechanisms and ways of having people feel that they are part and parcel of the national project. But the moment you disregard them and uh, just uh, dismiss them yes. as uh, just uh, charlatan and the mm -hmm. inconveniences and that we can do without you, I don't think that's the way to go. Nicolas, the, 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 the state seems to be in our healing mode. The past leaders have been ordered. In the past, we call them different things. Swines and all that. But the, the point yeah, is... We are calling them charlatans. <laughs> <laughs> we give them medals. Yeah, anyone... A charlatan is the healing mode. Nicolas, the, please go on. James Kashai, James Kashai, make no mistakes. The incredible achievement this country has has, has attained since independence. Incredible, but also you can't believe them. No, incredible. <laughs> incredible. <laughs> you can't believe them. Yeah, I mean yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so there are things to celebrate about, you know. Uh, but I'm not the kind of person who is going to eat all my income at Christmas and not worry about January. Yeah, yeah. We are worrying about January. We are saying Uganda can turn the page and become a more democratic state, a more people-centered state, and a more prosperous state. That's the point we are doing. Nobody begrudges the fact that things have, 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 have worked. Some things have worked. I mean, you couldn't do this in the past, have a discussion like this. We've got to appreciate that. You couldn't even have money. There was a yes. time when it was a consumptive yes. economy. As a student, I had a lot of money because people would give it to me to spend. We have been a movement in order to that. If I may. But is it sustainable? Nicholas, if I may. That's the question. If I may. So, so the sustainability of, that, of those achievements, <laughs> how grounded it is, is, is what we're discussing, what we should do to make them actually hold. So, we have actually had cause to celebrate, but let's look at the next day as well. Guma, nobody is attacking the person of the president. I presume he's a nice guy as a private person, but the institution of the presidency is different from the person of Kaguta URM 70. And we've got to discuss it because that's a public office. He's, he's supposed to hold office on our behalf, so we've got to address some of the concerns we have so that that institution can listen. If at all it has a listening ear, it has to listen. The other important thing is, processes like this that the CBR has been involved in is highly, highly appreciative. 
I wish we could have many of these. Many of these throughout the country to organize people to speak about these right. things that concern them. Beyond elections, beyond voting, we we'll have to go. We've got to applaud people like uh, the CDR. We we'll have to go. Thank you very much indeed. Our dear guests, Professor Josephine Haikir, Executive Director of the Center for Basic Research. Thank you for coming to Spectrum, madam. Thank you. Too. Maiden visit, I believe. Dr. Mambusi and Davis, a senior lecturer of history at Macquarie University. Thank you for coming to Spectrum. Thank you. Mr. Nicholas Opio, legal consultant at Archigil, social and political commentator. Certainly not the first time, uh, believe not the last. Thank you for tuning in. I've been your host Edmond, Jesus Spectrum. We'll be back tomorrow. Up next is the news. Don't worry, sweetie. With the Western Union shopping.